Earlier this year, I was in Spain, walking past the North Korean embassy in Madrid. It's a burnt orange compound in the Valda Marine Quarter, a posh district known for its parks and luxurious residences. The embassy's entry gate is discreet. It's set back from the sidewalk and flanked by an imposing wall. Little can be seen from the road, and most people in the neighborhood walk by without giving the building a second thought. I rang the buzzer. Uh, yes, hello, this is Bradley Hope. I'm a journalist from America, and I wanted to see if Mr. So was available. Um, our secretary is here right now. Is he going to be back in the country soon? Mr. So, or So Yun Suk, is the North Korean embassy in Spain's commercial attaché. Three years ago, he reached out to an underground organization, Cholima Civil Defense, later renamed Free Joseon. The organization is dedicated to taking down the North Korean regime by helping high-profile officials like So Yun Suk defect and So wanted to leave North Korea for good. So a group of roughly 10 people, all involved with Free Joseon, embarked on a rescue mission, but it was disguised as a kidnapping. In North Korea, there's a long-standing tradition of punishing three generations of a defector's family to prevent anyone from simply running away. The fake kidnapping was a ploy to not get the attaché's parents, grandparents, and siblings thrown into a gulag once he, his wife, and son disappeared. It didn't quite work out the way they planned. It actually went completely awry. And the fake kidnapping was reported as a real kidnapping, a terrorist attack. It was a raid stunning in its audacity, an operation launched against one of Kim Jong-un's most important foreign embassies, all done in broad daylight. To barge into a, an embassy and to overpower the, the people there and then to hold them hostage and some reporting that they beat them, they, they put hoods over their head, I mean, it's incredibly brazen. U.S. authorities arrested a Korean-American man who is part of a group allegedly responsible for the recent storming of a North Korean embassy in Spain. Former U.S. Marine Christopher Ahn was taken into custody on Thursday and appeared at a federal court in Los Angeles the following day. My name is Christopher Ahn. I'm 42. No, I'm not. I'm 41. Yeah, I'm 41. Okay, let me start over. <laughs> My name is Christopher Ahn. Uh, I'm 41 years old and I'm from Los Angeles, California. Christopher Ahn has the stocky physique of a Marine veteran, but an emotionally transparent face. He was the only one arrested when Spain brought a criminal case against the men involved in the embassy incident. He spent months in a prison in Los Angeles, and then faced more than a year of strict house arrest. He's still fighting efforts by Spain to extradite him. Back in May, almost a whole year after a hearing about his case, the judge reluctantly ruled he was technically eligible for extradition. How did he get caught up in all of this? Spanish authorities say the ringleader was this man, human rights activist Adrian Hong Chang. In 2010, Christopher was introduced to a guy named Adrian Hong by a mentor of his. Christopher and Adrian were at similar places in life, late 20s, trying to figure things out, but the two were in many ways the inverse of each other. When I met Adrian, I was very impressed with just him as a person. And we were very, very different as people. I'm kind of an older guy now, but I like feeling young. I like cartoons, you know, I like stickers. I'm just kind of a big kid at the end of the day. But Adrian was not really that. He's far more serious, far more pensive. But it became very clear that he understood kind of his purpose and why he was here. This is Brazen Presents, a podcast from Project Brazen telling true stories from all over the world. My name is Bradley Hope, and I'm the author of a new book, The Rebel and the Kingdom, that explores the backstory of Adrian Hong, Christopher Ahn, Free Joseon, and the incident in Madrid. In this episode, I'm explaining how I came to cover these events, and I'm exclusively interviewing Christopher Ahn about how his life was upturned by them. You can learn more about the book and find a link to buy it from at rebelinthekingdom.com. I first met Adrian long before the Madrid incident. In 2011, I was in Libya reporting on the civil war during the Arab Spring. I was based at the time in Benghazi, where things were quieter, so every day I would go as far west as I could 
to get news about the final battle of the war in Sirte, Muammar Gaddafi's last bolt hole. On one of those visits, just as I was about to leave with a colleague, I saw a crowd forming. We went over and found an 18-year-old college freshman named Chris Jun. He was wearing a blue Lakers jersey and carrying a shotgun. It turned out he was on spring break and he'd hitchhiked into Libya to join the rebels. I want to go to start. There are two right. Okba brigades. One. I wrote a story about him for The National, an English newspaper based in Abu Dhabi, where I was working at the time. It went viral. Chris Gion is a math major at UCLA. It's maybe Chris Gion, a student at UCLA. Bought a one-way ticket from LA to Cairo. Traveled by- I heard from many people, including Chris's dad, but also from a man named Adrian Hong. Adrian told me he was in Libya too, on some unspecified mission. He said he'd like to help Chris return safely to his family in California. I found him mysterious and fascinating, so I stayed in touch. We started messaging when Kim Jong-il died, and he began to tell me more about his lifelong obsession, helping the people of North Korea. For some eight years, I'd meet Adrian whenever we crossed paths in New York or London, but I could never quite figure out what to make of him. Was he a spy? He certainly seemed like one at times, with his never-ending international travel, his interest in all things related to national security and espionage. I always concluded he wasn't quite a spy, but he also wasn't a pretender. Adrian never really filled me in on anything he was up to, except to suggest he had extraordinary insight into what was happening in North Korea through his personal network. I didn't know anything about his underground organization at that point. He was always very idealistic too. Here's him giving a talk about his mission. There's no illusion as to how bad the regime is. The delusion is that we think that this is an inevitable crisis that cannot be fixed, that we have no right to do anything or that we have no ability uh, to do anything about it. I think that there will be a day when North Korea is free. It may be 100 years from now or maybe 10 years from now. That's very much how he sounded even in casual conversation. In 2019, several weeks after the Madrid incident, I was grabbing a coffee in Borough Market in London, scrolling on Twitter, when I stopped dead in my tracks. I was looking at a wanted poster from the US Marshals. It said the words, armed and dangerous, and there was a recent photo of Adrian's face. He'd undergone something of a physical transformation from when I first met him a decade ago. Back then, he was clean cut, always wearing a suit, but by 2019, he'd grown a beard and had a man bun. Something about him looked a little wilder. The wanted poster said he was behind an alleged assault on the North Korean embassy in Madrid. When I wrote to him that day over Signal, he'd already disappeared from the face of the earth. He was last seen driving a Kia with the license plate Ardent, according to the poster. For the past three years, I've been investigating this case and learning everything I could about Adrian and his group. As I learned more about those events, I got to meet Christopher Ahn, who was the only one to be arrested for his involvement in Spain. In this episode, I want to explain a little bit more about the story and introduce Christopher's voice to the world. Hearing him speak might help you understand why I became so obsessed with telling this story. It comes down to a simple question for me. What happens when ordinary people decide they want to change the world? Christopher told me that he and Adrian had met in 2010 in a Mexican restaurant in San Diego. It was several months before I first heard from him in Libya. Over burritos, the two men started to get to know each other. He as well was kind of figuring out where he, where he wanted to go and what his next steps were. And it was nice talking to someone that understood the need to, to fill both of those needs, both financially and, and the things that kind of give purpose in life. And so we shared a commonality in that. At the time, Christopher was considering doing an MBA, but Adrian saw no point in going back to school. He had nearly dropped out during his senior year of college because it was holding him back from doing what he wanted to do. Business school is dumb, he said. But Christopher ignored Adrian's advice and applied to the Darden School of Business at the University of Virginia. So nothing really came of that meeting, and they went their separate ways. Chris to business school in Virginia and Adrian to whatever he was up to, but they kept in touch. He would call and ask me what I was doing and checking in, and I would check in with him and see what he was doing. And he had told me that he had been traveling throughout Europe and traveling to Egypt and Libya and, and witnessing firsthand what they had experienced where they had overthrown their dictator and had 
started this new endeavor of creating a country that the people wanted to create themselves. And so, you know, we would have these random conversations every once in a while, maybe once, twice a year. You know, and I didn't have any kind of fun, you know, exciting stories like that. It was just usually just me listening. But as time started growing further, he wanted to use what he had learned into something that could be used for good. They were both not sure what that would be, but if it was for a good cause, Christopher said he was in. That I said, look, that sounds fantastic. You know, whatever it is that you need me to do, uh, or would like me to do, just let me know. Seven years later, Christopher Ahn was on vacation in Manila, in the Philippines, when he got a call from Adrian. There was no small talk. Adrian cut to the chase. Was he aware of the assassination of Kim Jong-nam? Kim Jong-nam was the eldest son of Kim Jong-il, North Korea's dear leader. He was seen as a contender for Kim Jong-il's heir until in 2001 when he traveled to Japan using a fake name on a forged Dominican passport. He was detained by Japanese authorities for three days. After that, he became the controversial black sheep of the Kim family. His life was largely a mystery in the following years, but it later emerged he liaised with intelligence agencies in both the United States and China and lived a well-financed lifestyle. Kim Jong-nam was a degenerate gambler. He was also known to undertake expensive travel to places such as Geneva, buy expensive watches, and hang out in high-end bars. North Korea had been tracking Kim Jong-nam's movements for years, carefully crafting a plan to end his life. To the Kim regime back home, Kim Jong-nam was a loose end that needed to be eliminated, and in 2017, they finally succeeded in taking him out in Malaysia. And obviously that made international news, and in Asia specifically, it was just all over the place. Adrian told me, he said, his son, uh, had reached out to him and had told him that he received a phone call from somebody in North Korea, I guess the trusted person in North Korea, that assassins were now out to, to execute him as well and to get him as well. Kim Han Sol, the son of Kim Jong Nam, was the last remaining male in the bloodline who could legitimately claim to be descended from Kim Il Sung, the founder and supreme leader of North Korea. Adrian had met him in early 2013 in Paris where Kim Han Sol was studying at an elite university. But right after his dad's assassination, his life too was in danger. His security guards had disappeared and that he was by himself. Him and his family were, were by themselves uh, and they didn't know what to do. And they were asking Adrian for help. Kim Han Sol was in Macau with his family and Christopher was in Manila. Adrian arranged for them to meet in Taipei. So Christopher went on Expedia to buy three plane tickets from Macau to Taipei for Kim Han Sol, his mother and his sister. Christopher bought a ticket for himself from Manila to Taipei. The next day they met at the airport. Kim Han Sol greeted Christopher with the prearranged code name, Steve, and Christopher quietly took them to a VIP lounge where they could lie low until Adrian and his team gave an update on the next move. Christopher saw his job as keeping everyone calm and relaxed. Ever the laid back Los Angeles native, he spoke softly to Kim Hansol's mother in Korean and gave his iPad to Kim Hansol's teenage sister to watch Netflix. Kim Hansol was spooked, but seemed in control. When I looked at him, he wasn't some North Korean guy or you know, the prince of North Korea or, or whatever it is that people want to call him and stuff. To me, he was a guy that just lost his dad and was needed help finding a way to safety. And that's who he was to me. You know, he had just lost his father who was assassinated and he was trying to figure out what he was going to do to take care of his family. And his mother and his younger sister were looking at him to guide them and to lead them to safety. And that's something that I intimately understood. You know, um, my father passed away when I was 17 and I was thrust into a role where I needed to be kind of the head of the household. And I needed to take on the roles of being a father to my younger brother and a husband to my, my mother in many, in many different ways. The 
The airport was busy, but other travelers seemed to pay little attention to the group camped out in the lounge. Finally, Adrian called with news. The Netherlands would grant them asylum. Christopher bought another round of tickets on his credit card to Amsterdam and then escorted them to the gate. Normally it's only people with tickets <laughs> that are allowed in the boarding area, but I just kind of steamrolled in there. I said, okay, here's these tickets. I, I, I wanna go say goodbye to my family members, you know, at the gate. And we went up to the gate and, um, you know, I, I, I gave Han Solo a hug and I gave the mother a hug and, and the daughter a hug and, every, and her sister. Um, and I said, you know, everything's gonna be okay. The gate agent took Kim Han Sol and his family's passports to check. When he looked down, he saw that they were from the Democratic People's Republic of Korea, the official name of North Korea. So he looks at them and then he looks at me and he says, well, where's your passport? Where's your ticket? And I said, well, I'm not going anywhere. Uh, I just wanted to see my, my family friends off. And they go, where's your passport? I go, my passport's right here. And he goes, well, let me see it. And I go, sure. And now this gate agent has an American passport and three North Korean passports. And so he freaks out and he says, you're not getting in here. They're not getting on the plane. At this point, Christopher was not sure what else to do. So he took them back to the lounge to regroup. While they were waiting there, two men showed up in the lounge and asked to speak with Christopher. They told him they were from the CIA. One was Korean descent looking and another was an older white guy. And they told me that they were from the CIA. And I said, okay. You know, I don't know if you are, you're telling me, you're not showing me any ID or anything like that, but okay. And I call Adrian and I ask him, hey, like the CIA guys are here. Is this legit or is this, is this real? And uh, he says, hold on. And he gives me a call back later. He's like, yes, those are legit CIA guys. And so, you know, there's a big part of me that's relieved, right? Where, you know, I, who am I? I'm just some random guy. <laughs> I'm just some random guy that's here that's just, just trying to help. They waited in the lounge overnight, and while they were waiting, Christopher shot a short video on his phone of Kim Han Sol as an insurance policy to protect him and the group, in case someone questioned what happened later. Hi, uh, my name's Kim Han Sol, uh, from uh, North Korea, part of the Kim family. My father has been killed a few days ago. Uh, I'm currently with uh, my mother and my sister, and we're very grateful to uh, Adrian for his help. Uh, Adrian and his team. Later, Adrian and his team would learn that the family had arrived in Amsterdam, but left with the Korean descent-looking CIA guy through another exit. They promptly boarded another flight out of the country, likely to the United States. According to South Korean media reports, Kim Han Sol was last seen at a Shake Shack in Washington, D.C. in 2021. Regarding with what happened in Madrid, you know, obviously this is still an ongoing uh, legal issue that I'm, I'm fighting with. So I can't necessarily say everything that it is that I, that I wish I could say. Um, there's so much to the story that I want to share with everyone to understand like, why the situation was so dire for them. After the mission in Madrid went completely awry, Christopher and the others arrived back in the US and immediately contacted the FBI to explain what had happened. It turned out to be a fatal mistake because when Spain brought charges against the men and asked for help from the US, the FBI simply turned over their testimony and confirmed they all admitted to being involved in the incident. Christopher almost didn't go to Spain. Although he was busy with his startup, he couldn't help but be intrigued by a mission he knew nothing about. When he was arrested, it was the first time anyone in his family learned anything about his secret volunteer work with the group. Nobody knew any of the activity that I was doing, I wasn't doing any of this stuff because, you know, I was trying to look for fame or, or, or trying to do this for money. In fact, there were so many times where I, I even had conversations with Adrian and said that like, hey, I really don't want to do this, you know? Like, this stuff is scary and, and dangerous and, and I'm willing to help because you need help. But I would really appreciate it if you could find other people that could also help. And he always told me that like, look, I, I wish I didn't have to do this, right? After I got arrested, you know, my wife moved out all our, our stuff and we moved into my mother's house. 
And part of the initial conditions was I couldn't even get mail. I couldn't go out to the backyard to, you know, grill a hamburger if I wanted to or something. And I couldn't take the trash out. The, the house literally became a house arrest. It was a house jail. Finally, in 2021, Judge Rosenbluth modified his bail so that he could travel in a restricted zone from 8 a.m. to 8 p.m., which allowed Christopher to care for his mother, who has a disease called trigeminal neuralgia that causes extreme pain in the face, and his 99-year-old grandmother, who lived together in their home nearby. But in reality, the hardest thing is just kind of dealing with the stigma of this. It's been difficult finding just steady employment. You know, people Google my name and think that I'm some kind of crazy terrorist guy or, or some kind of weird Jason Bourne kind of spy guy or something like that when, you know, I, I'm obviously not that person. I'm just a guy that was trying to help somebody. After sitting down with Christopher for countless hours, listening to what had happened, I realized that this is one of the most high-profile cases based on a total misunderstanding I've ever seen. Christopher wanted to volunteer to help North Koreans in any way he could, but because of a series of unbelievable yet understandable choices by Free Joseon and misunderstandings on a global level, his life has been hijacked by this case. He flew into Spain a Marine veteran, newly married, with a business degree and a startup company. Years later, he's struggling to get by, living in a state of fear he'll end up in a Spanish prison or a North Korean assassin's crosshairs. He and his wife were keen to start a family, but their plans are on hold. There's no relief on the horizon unless the Spanish drop their charges or the U.S. government decides it won't extradite him because it agrees the whole incident was a failed defection, not an attempted kidnapping. Do I have any regrets? Would I do it all over again? You know, and a lot of times, you know, thinking about that kind of stuff is just kind of a waste of time, right? But I think the thing that I struggle with m most is I just don't understand. <laughs> I really just don't understand why I'm in this situation. And maybe that's naive. Maybe that just makes me strange because it might be just kind of obvious to everyone else why I'm here. But to me, these people reached out because they didn't want to go back to a regime that could execute them or dictate how their entire lives were going to be and the generations of, of, of families that they would have after them. And they wanted to escape that. And I just don't understand why I'm in this situation and why my decision to help people is ending up hurting so many people. It's hard for me to, to square that. The entire story of Adrian and Free Josan raises a deep question about whether people can change the world. What does it really take? So much of what Adrian said to me and others over the years goes to the heart of this. He frequently talked about how everything, startups that became big companies, or activism that leads to an uprising, started with a single act of faith that nothing is too big to achieve. Whether you admire him or find him pretentious or even dangerous, there's something powerful in that belief. As to whether he made a difference with his underground organization, it will take a long time yet to fully know the answer. Thank you for listening, and please buy a copy of The Rebel in the Kingdom from your local bookstore or other online retailers. To learn more about the unbelievable story of Adrian, Christopher, and Free Josan, audiobook and ebook versions are also available. You can learn more at rebelandthekingdom.com. This episode of Brazen Presents was hosted by me, Bradley Hope. Subin Kim produced this episode and was part of the reporting team working on the book. Claire Urban engineered this episode, and Nicholas Brennan was our executive producer. Lucy Woods provided research and fact-checking. <laughs>